Well, good morning. Good to see each of you. Nice to be here this morning. Beautiful, sunny, I want to say spring day, but it's almost like summer out there. It's, it's great. Anyways, so this morning, uh, as I've in- introduced the book of James before, um, the book of James is a letter uh, much like the Proverbs of the Old Testament. And um, when you look at the book of James from start to finish, there is a lot of wisdom that's packed into this little book. And today I'm going to be continuing my series in, in James. And our text this morning is found in James chapter 4 from verses 13 to 17. So we're just going to walk into the next section here. And uh, the title of my message is Tomorrow is in God's Hands. Would you bow with me in prayer as we ask God's blessing upon his word? Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you've given us everything. You've given us everything that we need for life and for godliness. So this morning, Lord, as we go through your word, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that our hearts would be open to hear what your spirit says through your word, and that you give me the ability to articulate it in a way that would be honoring to you that you intend for these people to hear. And we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, some of you guys here weren't born in 1982, but a lot of us were. And um, a lot of us were born decades before that. Now, in 1982, there was, um, it was kind of at the tail end of, you guys seen that movie that went through the theaters or heard about it if you hadn't seen it, Jesus Revolution. Um, There was a Jesus movement in North America through the 70s and into the 80s. And one of the the people that became fairly prominent in this movement, especially near the end, was a songwriter and musician named Keith Green. You guys heard of Keith Green before? Um, Keith was actually in 1982 at the peak of his ministry uh, career. And um, his passion to serve Jesus um, was very inspiring, I would say. And, and he had a love for the Lord that, um, that seemed to glow, uh, a love for the Lord that very few people seem to have, actually. And I know that um, when I've spoken with other people and, and I've heard just how Keith's life and his ministry impacted people, that it had an uh, impact on multiple thousands of, of individuals, including mine. Um, I, some of my, my uh, best times with the Lord have been, you know, my intimate times. I mean, they're all good, but, you know, those times where you just connect really closely with God, you just have been, when I've been listening to Keith's music and, and worshiping the Lord along with it, and well, Keith, um, back in 1982, uh, he owned a, a place down in the States with an airstrip, and, and he had a love for flying. And um, actually, he used an airplane so he could fly to his different uh, venues all over the place. And um, he had a family there. And one day, on July 28th in 1982, they, they uh, were at their, at their property, and... Um, a, a family of friends came to visit them. Um, two, two of their f- close friends and, and their six children came to visit. Well, it was a nice day, so they figured that they would all, um, they'd get this family because they didn't get a chance to fly very often. They'd get this family and, and uh, Keith and, and two of his kids would go up with the eight people in this other family up for a flight just to see the area and, and just because it was a unique experience and they wanted to... B- the Greens wanted to bless this other family, so they all went into the plane, and Keith had a pilot that flew this, this large plane. And so they went up, and, and, and shortly after takeoff, um, the, the plane had mechanical problems, and it plummeted from the sky and hit the ground in a ball of flames. And, and Keith, his two children, and all eight people in this family, plus his pilot, they were killed instantly. And, um, you know, 
it was a shock to a lot of folks. I mean, Keith was at the peak of, of, uh, of his outreach, and he was involved in a lot of different ministry activities that were just touching a lot of people. People were coming to Christ through it. And, you know, it, it just seemed like all of a sudden, boom, that was it. Well, a tragedy of this magnitude. I, I think back on this, and, and Keith, you know, like when I was younger, I'd listen to his music, and, you know, since I've become a pastor, I, I often still listen to his music, and, and you can just, you just jive with the, the anointing. I guess there's an, a special anointing on that. But, you know, we have a season in our lives where we're here, and then our life is over. You know, I, I explain this tragedy. Can you imagine being the extended family and friends of, uh, of these people that suddenly got taken away? A tragedy of this magnitude, it, it reminds us th that we really don't know the day or the hour where we're going to have our appointments with eternity. You know, human life is a gift. It, it's, it's beautiful, but it's so fragile. And, you know, eventually, all of us here, unless we're part of the rapture, right, all of us here are going to face death. And death doesn't always wait until our lives feel like they're complete and in order. A long life in the realm of the flesh is not guaranteed. Tomorrow, in this realm that we live in right now, is not guaranteed. And people in this world are so confident that they're going to be able to plan for tomorrow. When the truth is that in our fleshly state, tomorrow may never come. And King David, he put it this way in, in the Psalms. In Psalm 103, uh, 14 to 16, King David said this. He says, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like the grass. They flourish like the flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. And James, in our text this morning, he addresses this very issue. In James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, James says this, he says this, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So the truth is, when you read that scripture, the time that we're, we're granted here in this body is so uncertain. And, and Jesus told a parable of a of a man who, who I guess you could say he was overconfident and proud, thinking that he had the world by the tail. And this man was enjoying his life and everything in it. And he didn't want to think about eternal things. He wanted to focus on his living in the present and plan so that he could enjoy his life tomorrow. In Luke chapter 12, verses 16 to 21, 21 Jesus tells this parable and he says, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life will de be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. As demonstrated through this parable, our time on the earth here is uncertain. But our life here in this state, even at a, 
longest, I guess you could say, if you live to 104, 105, your time is really short. Those of you who are reaching that edge, you guys know how quickly time has gone, and you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, where did all these wrinkles and gray hair and where all these... Who's looking back at me? I, that's not the person that I remember looking back at me. I mean, it just happens like that. You're young. If you're young here today, you can be sure. Age is going to creep up on you if God grants you the years, and it's going to happen very fast. Life is short. The time we are granted here is short. And we measure it in years, but when you compare our little life here and the years that it, that it entails to God's eons of eternity, there's no end to it. This is just like a tiny little speck of dust. James tells us our life in the physical frame is like a mist. And when you think about mist in nature, you know, a mist appears in the morning um, in the countryside. You know, you, you think about mist. Appears in the morning in, in the countryside, but it dissipates quickly as the wind comes up and blows it away or as the sun comes up and, uh, and dissolves it and it uh, disappears. Mist is only a brief phenomena of nature. So our lives are like a mist. And it's foolish and it's wrong for a man to make plans for tomorrow when we don't, with confidence that we're in control, I should say, when we don't know what's going to happen. We really don't. We count our years on our birthday. But God tells us to number our days. In Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, we read, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. And, and further down in Psalm 90, in verse 12, we read, David says, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. A heart of wisdom. That's what God's people need. We need a heart of wisdom when we look at our lives, when we look at where we are and, and what we are here for. In our text this morning, an illustration is given of a, of a businessman who, who carefully plans and then he charts out his fu future course of objectives. He plans to travel from this city to that city over a period of a year and, and to make some money in each city that he comes to. And, you know, He's confident that this is what he's going to do. I will do this. We will do this. And the world in its wisdom would suggest that this would be a sound strategy for living. That's what we hear all the time, isn't it? Well, it's not a, a bad thing for us to make plans, but that's not what this is about. You see, overconfidence in our own plans is not heavenly wise. It's worldly wise. James tells us here to accept our mortality, accept our lack of control, accept our shortness of life, and accept that we are frail. And this is heavenly wise because when we accept those facts and the fact that we don't ultimately have the say in how things are going to go, our heart is turned towards eternity. And then we live with eternity in perspective. Our focus is not primarily going to be about the things of this world and what we can gather unto ourselves and how we can build our own kingdoms. But our lives will be focused on being wholly devoted to the God who gave us life. And rather than saying, I'm going to go and do this, or I'm going to do that, or I'm going here, I'm going there, in verse 15, James tells us, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. 
And sometimes this has become a catchphrase or a, a, I guess a cliche or a, you know, a smart saying of some kind where people kind of pay homage to it with the lips. But what James is saying here, there's an implication behind what he says we should say. It's a heart attitude that needs to be prevalent, that God calls us to remember. And I guess you could call it, when it comes down to it, the fear of the Lord. See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 says this, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Well, well, this week in, a, in Awana's large group sessions, I was talking to the children in a large group session about, about wisdom. And, and what is wisdom? And, and, and wisdom is actually the right application of knowledge. True wisdom aligns itself with the truth. God's wisdom, heavenly wisdom, aligns itself with the truth. In the Bible, the word translated fear, when it says fear, the fear of the Lord, can mean several things. I mean, it can mean terror in a frightening situation. It can mean respect in a way that a servant fears his master and 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 serves him faithfully, or you f- feel when you're under the gaze of your employer, if you're an employee. Right? Fear can also denote the reverence or awe that a person feels in the presence of greatness. And I, I, I put it to you that the fear of the Lord is a combination of all those things. It's a great reverence, but yet it, it's an understanding of the power of God and His majesty. And, and it is a deep sense of respect knowing that He is Lord. He is Lord. I am not. Fear of the Lord can be defined as the continual awareness that our loving Heavenly Father, who is the Creator and King over the universe, is watching and He's evaluating everything we say and do. As Jesus told the seven churches in the Revelation, you guys, when you read the first two chapters of Revelation, Jesus says, I know your works. See, God is watching. He knows our heart. He knows where we're putting our stake. He knows everything about us. He knows whether we're lukewarm or we're hot for Him. He knows whether our love for Him is fresh and vital or if it has waxed cold. The gaze of the Lord knows all things. And ultimately we would be good and do good to understand that God is sovereign over all. And more specifically, God is sovereign over all time. Over all time. We should not adapt an arrogant assumption of self-sufficiency as though we're going to pull the strings leading us to declare this independence from God in our spirits. And when you think about it, when you think about it, an, an attitude of independence, uh, attempting to be independent from God, is what led to the original sin in the Garden of Eden, isn't it? The knowledge of good and evil is actually um, taking the power of deciding for yourself what is good and what is evil and then acting on it accordingly in a claim of complete moral independence from God. It's the opposite of the fear of the Lord. It's arrogant. So, when you boil down everything to the root issue, the very first sin was actually an attack on God's sovereignty. And it is rooted in human pride. And so James continues and he says in verse 16, As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all boasting, all such boasting is evil. And sadly, 
we find ourselves making decisions. And I, I don't think there's a person here that could say that I always get it right, you know, and that I haven't um, maybe trusted in myself more than I should. I mean, we get sidetracked by the world and its and its desires, and we we got the world, the flesh, and the enemy, the devil, and his demons out there tugging and and pushing, and and we can get distracted, and and, and we can actually try and muscle our way through this world and do what we have to do to gain control over really, when you look at it, is outside of our control. So, James says, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. And he's talking to everybody that decides that they're going to take the throne and that they're going to decide how things are going to go and how they're going to turn the tide of events in their life and in the world around them. But um, the Greek word for, for boast in this case here is uh, lasagna. And it's not that wonderful pasta that you might find down on the table downstairs for a lunch. A lasagna, a lasagna in this verse refers to boast. And it's not that yummy Italian pasta, right? A lasagna river, re, refers to proud and arrogant confidence in one's own knowledge or cleverness. So when he's saying, as it is, you, a lasagna, you have this proud, arrogant confidence in your own knowledge and cleverness with your schemes that you're scheming in your life. But remember what James said in James chapter 117. What did he say in 117? He said, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift. That means all good and perfect gifts comes from God who does not change like shifting shadows, forever the same. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. He's always the same. God is the same. He is sovereign. And in the wisdom of this world, man is independent, and he doesn't need God's oversight. And as Christians, we can, if we step out of line with the Spirit, we can step in our flesh to taking, trying to take control back again. But it's not, it's not, it's futile. It's, it's, unproductive it's unwise the world in the world man is independent he doesn't need god's oversight the plans are made in the spirit of a lasagna conforming to the patterns of this world it's written in romans 12 2, do not conform to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see? Man says that he's master of his fate, captain of his own ship. The world says, look within yourself for the answer. The wisdom of the world says, trust in yourself. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible says, trust in God. The world says, believe in yourself. The Bible says, believe in God. The world says you are wonderful. The Bible says you are a sinner. And unless you repent, you will perish. The world says you can do it. The Bible says let God do it. The world says discover how wonderful you are. The Bible says discover how wonderful God is. The world says, you just need to change your attitude. But the Bible says, you need a change of heart. The world's encouraging you to discover the God within. The living God says, I am God and there is no one else but me. It would be fair to say that pride, the sin of a lasagna 
is something that could potentially plague each one of us sitting here today and could get us off track. And this is why James is speaking the way he is to the church, because as Christians, our, our, our hope is found on nothing less but Jesus Christ and righteousness. The Word of God is life-giving to us. And if we hear the Word of God and we need to shift gears and lay aside something that we've taken up, we need to repent about something, we need to pursue something. The Word of God is given to us as a framework for us to follow. And the Spirit of God brings the Word of God alive. Now, we all know about trials, don't we? Everyone's faced them. You're always facing trials as people. We know this. Very, very... Uh, Few people skate through a week without at least some sort of a trial. Trials will come to test our faith. And you see, when we have given over to this a lasagna, if we as his dearly loved children grow in proud independence from our Savior, He's going to humble us to bring us back. Because He knows that it's not good for us. It's not healthy for us to go that way. And because of His great love for us as His children, He's not going to let us get away with it. He's going to cause something to happen in our lives that's going to level our alazonia. No one likes facing troubles. I don't like it. But you know something, if you look back at the troubles in your life, no matter how bad they are, and you actually see it from a distance, and you see what's happened in your life as a child of God, you see that trouble actually diffuses a much worse problem that would manifest and pull us away from a close relationship with God if left unattended. God says this in Hebrews chapter 12, 7 and 8. He says, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children, as His children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So then, a man who listens to what James is saying here and is compelled to set aside and abandon his tendency to have this proud, independent spirit and to adopt an attitude of reverent fear and dependence on the Holy Spirit, that man, if he listens to God and lays all those things aside that tangle him, that man will see the blessing of God. And I'm not saying that the blessing of God is only in the good times. You're going to see the blessing of God in the form of His discipline sometimes when you go through trials. Because the blessing of God has an objective that is eons different than yours or mine. My objectives are so short-sighted. God's objectives are eternal. He takes everything and works it together for good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Do you believe this? This is God's Word. He takes everything and makes it something that is good in the end. Even if it doesn't seem like it right now. So in forming our plans for our futures, God calls us to have these contrite hearts filled with humble obedience. This means looking to His Word as a lamp to light our way, to guide our path and submitting our will and laying down our independent spirit to God and saying, take it, Lord. Every good thing comes from you. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. This is what Jesus meant in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, when he said, come unto me, all you who are weary 
and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we come to the Lord and we lay it down and we just say, Lord, Lord, I don't know what to do with this, but I'm just laying it down, God. Take it. You know the the future. You know everything about me. You know how I'm knit together. You know all my hang-ups, my problems, the things that I'm struggling with. God, I just want you to take me. I don't want anything to do with this spirit of independence, God. I am yours, and you are mine. You're my Savior, my Lord. And when we have that submission to the Holy Spirit that He calls us to bow our knee to, it is Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ought to give Him all the glory that He is due for every good and perfect thing that He gives to us and He provides to us. And in relation to this giving credit to God, if we don't, James says in verse 17, if anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Now that's a very narrow perspective in context with this scripture passage. When we're reading the word of God, I always say this, we need to look at that 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 individual scripture in the context that it's placed in and that's the primary meaning this is what he's saying in relation to the spirit of independence from God if we know that we're supposed to lay down that and we don't it's a sin however when you look at this principle from a broad perspective he's not just saying that about this he's saying this in general terms as well you'll find that There are sins of commission that we can fall into. And there are also sins of omission that we can fall into. And and what James is speaking here in this example is, in verse 17, is an example of a sin of omission. In relation to sins of commission, we know that uh, those things are non-negotiables, right? Abstaining from sins of commission are uh, things like um, not letting our potty mouth lead us into sin. Not letting our flesh come through, our tongue. Or, um, in 1 Peter 2.11, there's other things. Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. You know, those are talking about the sins of commission. It's easy for us to put our fingers on the sins of commission because they're very clearly defined, right? And, and those things we should abstain from. And yes, we should. If we love Jesus out of love for him, we should abstain from sins of commission. But somehow we find it easier to justify sins of omission as being almost like electives. In other words, we justify them by placing them into categories of personal preference and choices. And we treat them like we can choose to do this or we can't. We sin by omission. How do we do this? When we prioritize ourselves above what God calls us to do for His kingdom and for others. If a man knows what he ought to do, and he doesn't do it, he's guilty of sin. We're all sinners, so all of us are making mistakes along this line, and we need God's grace to forgive us and to set us on the rock, but God doesn't want us to continue in sins once we become unaware, once we become aware of it, right? That's what spiritual growth is all about. If we're doing something that needs to be changed, we need to change it. Why? Because God's calling us to, and he's given us the power and the spirit and the instructions and the word on how to do it. So, if a man knows what his duty is to do and willfully neglects that duty, he's guilty of sin. It's not an elective. If I know that I'm supposed to do something and I, I just don't feel like it today, or that's not my, ah, someone else can do that. 
we end up walking by the guys that are beaten up on the road, right? Like the Good Samaritan. We don't love our neighbors ourselves when we're in that mindset. You see, the highest privilege conferred upon human beings outside of the experience of, of the grace of God for the salvation of our own souls is that of doing good in this world. We are called to alleviate the misery and the suffering of others when it's in our power to make the difference. It's also a privilege for us to wear the clothes that we wear and to have the jobs that we have and to have the income in this, in this culture that we have. It's a privilege for us to have that and to be giving unto the Lord with our provisions. Yes, through tithes, through offerings, through provisions that he's blessed us with so that the kingdom of God would be established in our community and all over the world. But more than that, my friend, when God thought you up, when he gave you life, he created you with a number of, of different gifts and talents and abilities and skill sets. And there are certain ways that you can think and things that you do that you're just naturally good at. God's gifted you. These gifts and abilities, that they're how God shaped you. And he didn't shape you uniquely the way you are for your own benefits. As Christians, our lives are not our own. Our gifts and our abilities, our financial resources, everything that we have and are, were not just given to us for our own good. They've been given to, the, to us for the benefit of everyone else too. Because what is important to God? It's important to God. is seeing the lost saved and redeemed. That's what the Great Commission is all about. That's why the church needs to be about their master's business. And how can we do that unless we're all together in that? Each of us. For example, one of my gifts is teaching. And I, I put that gift to work for a number of years for the benefit of others. But it's not my gift, it's God's. He's given it to me to use for his purposes. To benefit others, to build others up, to strengthen others. But every single gift is just of that. Given to you to benefit others, to strengthen others, to lift others up, to point others to Jesus as their Savior to encourage those that are struggling and to see them strengthened. To see those who are suffering eased in their suffering. Maybe maybe we need to just go back to the drawing board. What is it that you've done here, God, with me? I'm a unique person. You're a unique soul that God's created. We're what has he put you here for? It's a good question. Lord, what would you have me to do in service to you, my king? See, this is laying aside the a lasagna, the pride of my own kingdom building, my own, my own life. It's mine to do what I want with, I, with what I have. And it's time to say, okay, Lord, with what you've given to me, where are you calling me? Do you want me to be a missionary? Maybe God's calling you to go to speak to an unreached people group. Maybe that's your calling. Maybe you're supposed to be a plumber. And you're supposed to work in your, in your job, in the place that you, you work downtown, and, and, and be an example of faith, love, and purity in, in word and in deed to the, to the other guys that work with you and the people that you go to service their houses. You, you see, everybody has something that God has put them into. We're not here by accident. We all have a mission. God is calling us, calling us to lay it down. You see, the, the spirit of what James is saying in this book, in this chapter, in this particular 
passage of verses. It's like he's, he's encouraging us not to say, I will do this, I will do that, I am this, I am that. No. As a believer, I am not my own. Everything that I have belongs to him. So God, what do you want to do with that? And if I know the good that I ought to do and I don't do it, I'm committing a sin of omission. It's as simple as that. And it's not an elective, folks. It's not an elective. It is a command of the Lord to surrender. He wants to be Lord over every aspect of our lives. Everything. All to you, Lord, I freely give. I will ever love and trust you in your presence daily. Live. I surrender all. So, the worldly wisdom says, grasp onto what you have and clutch it closely. Get the most of what you have for yourself. God says, take what you have that I have given you and give it back to me and see what I do. You want to see a church on fire for God? You want to see people come to know Jesus through Hillside Community Church? If we adopt this attitude of Christ, of servanthood and say, Lord, everything that I am and have is yours. You do that. You bow the knee of, a, of your heart to, to the Lord and the Holy Spirit will take your life and will launch you into good things. Man, I, I long. We long to see revival. This is the root of revival. It's the root. All to you, Lord, I freely give. How does he want us with. Hmm. May God forgive us for these sins of omission. May God forgive me. I don't always do the things that I know I should do. And this isn't a lesson in condemnation. There is therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But this is a reality check. You know, God has saved us and in response to His grace. What do we do? You see, James is all about not just yap, 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 but put the talk to the walk and vice versa. Put the walk to the talk, put the talk to the walk. Live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. Why? Because He loves us and He's given us everything. He's given us everything. Why should we hold back? This is why Jesus is the second Adam. Right? He undoes what the first Adam did. That independent spirit that was created in man's heart when he stepped away from God and said, I will, I will do this. I will do that. I will ascend. It's the same sin that Lucifer had. So, well, pastor, that's easy to say. Yes, it is. Very easy to say. <laughs> I'm not saying this is going to be easy. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it says this is going to be easy. The burden, yoke is easy and the burden is light. Yes. But putting into the practice means you're going to have to step away from your flesh and live in the spirit. Yeah. And that's, that's not easy for us to do. But when you do it, the burden is light, my friends. You want to know joy in living? Living wholeheartedly devoted to Jesus will bring you joy beyond all measure. This is beautiful. You know, so we don't have to worry about outgiving God. God's giving you abilities or talents or provisions or whatever. You don't have to worry about outgiving the Lord. He's going to take care of it all. This is why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You don't have to worry that, oh, you know, if I give too much of my time to ministering to those kids at the kids club, then I'm not going to have enough time for anything else at home. Right? Oh, look at all that I have to do. Well, guess what? You dedicate your time to those children and you pour your life into them. You minister to them and God will pour the blessing out on you like you can't even imagine. 
The blessing of God will flood into your life from so many different directions, you won't even be able to contain it. If that's what you're supposed to do, do it. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Matthew 6, 31, and I'll close with this. Jesus said, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow is enough worry of it, uh, about itself. We worry... For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The Lord is with you. You're his children. We don't have to work ourselves up to this. We just have to surrender. It's as simple as that. Are you willing to surrender to the Lord? I'm asking each person, including myself, am I willing to surrender to the Lord every area of my life? Sins of commission, gone. Lord, take them. Sins of omission, gone. Lord, take them. Man, you want to see power in the kingdom of God in 100 miles BC? Yeah. If every one of us grabs a hold of this and says, Lord, I can't do it, but I surrender, power will come from on high. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you hold us fast through all of life's circumstances. Lord, in the midst of the darkness, you are there. In the midst of our triumphs, you are there. You are Lord over all, and you care for your church, and you love each person here. God, I just pray, Father, that as we look at this passage of Scripture, God, that you'd forgive us for the independent spirit that sometimes we can take up, Lord, and James saw it so well, Lord, and he, he knew that the church needed to abandon that if it was going to be strong in you, Lord, and, and effective. So, Lord, as, as a church over 2,000 years later here in 100 Mile House, B.C., in this little place in the planet, Lord, we're just little people and we have very little to offer, but God, you're the one that brought us. You're the one that bought us. You're the one that paid for our sins and you're the one that called us. And who you bring and who you save and who you call, you equip. So Lord, help us to shine in this little place and may your light shine through us that they out there would see our good works not based on legalism, but they would see our good works based on genuine love for you and love for them and glorify you. Lord, we pray for a harvest of souls. We pray that the gospel would go forth in power in this community and all over the world through this church. We know that it's not our will, but thine be done, Lord. Our, your desire, God, is that we humble ourselves before you. So we do that, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us and establish us, Lord, to be the people that you've called us to be without reservations. In Jesus' name.